Hi, I'm Stephen Downs. In this short video, I want to talk about something I've talked about for a long time called the semantic condition. I've made a new diagram for it, and as I made the diagram, I thought I would explain how the diagram is constructed and what my thinking was behind it. The semantic condition is a network design principle. Network design principle tells us more or less how a network differs from traditional learning. The idea is that each principle confers an advantage over non-network systems. It's a way of evaluating new technology. Overall, there are eight different network design principles. These principles are in order, decentralize, distribute, disintermediate, disaggregate, disintegrate, democratize, dynamize, and desegregate. Most of these talk about the physical construction of the network, but one of these principles is special. It's principle number six. Principle number six talks about what I call the semantic principle or the semantic condition. What do I mean by that though? Well, principle six is democratize, but what is democracy? Well, democracy is ruled by the people. But, you know, there are many ways we can rule ourselves. We can rule ourselves in communist collectives. We can rule ourselves in capitalist, free market, survival of the fittest, or any of a number of other ways and means of organizing society. When I talk about the semantic condition, what I'm talking about is a mechanism for organization based on network principles that confers what I believe are the greatest advantages in terms of meaning, truth, and value. So let's get to that. And I'm going to get to that in a fairly traditional way. What I'm going to do is begin with where we always begin in discussions of society and government with the contrast between the state and the individual. It's an age old contrast, right? On one hand, we have the state, it owns everything, it controls everything, it is society, it is culture, it is the good of the collective. On the other hand, opposed to that is the individual, uh, the, the sole person, the one who has value as an ends and not a means to an ends, the voter, the citizen, the taxpayer, whatever. And we always hear these discussions of the state pitted against the individual. We can diagram that. The state might be organized from a central government, perhaps a single leader even, whereas the individual, well, they sort of work on their own. We think of the state as a single organized collective whole. We think of the individual as atoms, a kind of atomism. Indeed, the word democracy itself, interestingly, comes from well, it comes from rule by the people, but it also comes from Democritus, who had an atomistic view of the world. And there's an interesting coincidence there. So anyhow, there are different ways we can organize the state. This organization here, sometimes called a network, is a hierarchical structure. We still have someone in charge, that's the guy in the middle, uh, and but we still have, but we also have you know, distributed organization, we have some local government, but still things are organized around the center, still to be contrasted with the individual. Now, what I'm trying to do is find a middle point between these. I, I say it that way because everybody says, well, you know, the truth is somewhere in the middle. It's not always true, but in this case, I'm looking for a middle point, somewhere between the collectivism of the state and the individualism of the individual. So I call that the network. So the network is a form of organization where there are no centers. Each individual is connected to other individuals, but only to a few individuals, two, three, maybe four individuals as compared to uh, the conditions in the state where one individual may be connected to hundreds, thousands. So we see that as a middle ground between them. So when I'm talking about the semantic condition, 
I'm not really talking about the individual perspective, Ayn Rand, atomism, so on and so forth. So let's roll that right out of the picture. Let's move that kind of extreme capitalism, neo-fascism, whatever you want to call it, move it out of the picture. And really I'm talking about this distinction between what we've called for this video, the state and the network. Or as I sometimes say, groups and networks. Groups are the kind of centralized organization we see on the left. Networks are the decentralized kind of organization we see on the right. So that's going to be the emphasis here. But now don't get hung up by these names. Groups and networks, those are just names that I picked. By groups, I could mean companies. By networks, I could mean connectives. By groups, I could mean collaboratives. By networks, I could mean cooperatives. You see, the, the word itself doesn't matter. By groups, I could mean collectives. By networks, I could mean communities. We'll stick with this terminology for the rest of the conversation. But again, don't get hung up on the name. It doesn't matter. It's the two concepts that I'm after here. OK, so we have groups typical star shape organization focused on the center, networks, typical graph shape organization, a mesh or distributed network. So my proposition here is that groups are characteristic of society, organizations, schools, etc. today. Networks characterize the direction in which we're moving, where we want to go for the future. Groups value sameness. Groups value one way of doing things. And we're going to see that this idea of sameness and one way characterizes all the elements of groups throughout the rest of this discussion. Networks, by contrast, are not formed through sameness, not formed through identity, but rather through affinity. You join a group because the other members are the same as you. You join a network because you have an affinity with the other members of the network. Consequently, while in a group there's one way, in a network there's many ways. And we'll cash out what I mean by one way and many ways as we go along here. So groups are based on unity. What does that mean? Well, let's use an analogy. Think of a metal or an element. What makes gold gold? What makes iron iron, steel steel? It's that all of the atoms are the same. Maybe structured in a certain way, but what's really important is they're the same, or mostly the same in the case of an alloy. You know, you, you don't have a wild variation. You know, in organizations, the same sort of principle applies. Think of a company, a vision statement, for example. Everybody's supposed to line up underneath this vision statement and work toward this one objective. Sometimes in groups, even purity, you know, we want the pure membership of this group. Sometimes this unity can be achieved through some sort of process. Uh, the United States, for example, often characterizes itself as a melting pot where people come in from a variety of different cultures, but they all fuse and melt into one single unity e pluribus unum, out of many, one. By contrast, networks value diversity. What do I mean by that? Well, we could contrast the analogy of metallic or elemental vision, as characterized in groups, with an organic or biological vision, as characteristic of networks. Think of a forest. There isn't one kind of tree. There isn't one kind of plant, unless, you know, it's, it's a, a plantation or something like that. Um, you see a multitude of different biological species in a forest, in an ecosystem. Networks value mixtures. Networks, we can think of the analogy of a salad bowl, where there's one thing, but each piece of the salad is its own distinctiveness. And you have different vegetables, sometimes even different fruits, uh, different ingredients in your sauce, all mixed together, but each piece retaining its own distinctive property. Groups favor coordination. A group is something that is coordinated. This means leaders. This means collaboration. This means 
a group value as a whole, which typically means the leader's value. After all, you don't let the guy in the mailroom write the corporate vision statement, right? <laughs> So coordination is key in groups, and there's a lot of time, a lot of attention in groups paid to things like leadership, management, coordination, organization, and the like. By contrast, networks value autonomy. Autonomy means a different kind of organization. Individuals cooperate rather than collaborate. Instead of everybody working toward one outcome or one value. A network is an exchange where people are working toward different outcomes or different values, and the exchange is one that produces mutual value. So you help me get to Oregon, I help you get to Washington. We don't want to go in the same place, but it's worthwhile to share a car for a while. That's network principle in action. Groups are closed. Uh, not closed in the sense that nobody can get into them. That would be ridiculous. But closed in the sense that there's a clear line between being inside a group and being outside a group. Groups have membership. Groups meet in private or in camera. Groups have their own kind of jargon, their own kind of in-jokes, their own kind of standards for membership. Groups are characterized by walls. Even product lock-in, as in you know, ownership of Apple products, is a kind of closed group formation. By contrast, networks are open. What that means is networks are based on connection. Networks are based on perspective, context. Networks are based on bridges. We could talk a lot about open, but I see the next word has come up because I skipped this slide. Groups are distributive. That's kind of a hard word, a hard concept. So I'm going to take a little bit of time to cash this out. So the best way to think of distributive is through two metaphors. First of all, distributive in the sense of a broadcast where the content is at the center at WKRP and then it gets sent out to everybody. Or another way of thinking of distributive is through the trickle down theory. The rich have all the money and then the wealth trickles down through society. You see the same sort of concept at play here, right? By contrast, networks are interactive. Now, interactive means more than just the idea that people communicate with each other in networks. It's much more than that. Yes, though, there is a conversation. When, when, when um, uh, Clay Shirky and David Weinberger uh, wrote the Clue Train Manifesto, they were saying uh, markets are conversations. What they were saying is markets are networks. So an interaction in a market isn't from them to you, the way a distributive system would work, but rather a conversation between relative equals in an exchange of mutual value. Let's draw this out a bit further. In a distributive group, you have stars and gurus, the center from which all ideas flow out. Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, the President of the United States, uh, Bono, whomever, right? The idea is that you have a centralized point and the star or the guru is whoever occupies the center. By contrast, you don't have that so much or at all in a network. Uh, influence, control, wealth, power, these are distributed uh, much more equally across members in a network. The type of organization is not a centralized organization. It's much more of what we might call a democratic organization, or, or we might even say post-democratic, because, you know, democracy is often just confused with voting, and that could be either groups or networks. Uh, but uh, here we're talking about networks that are democratic in the sense that the conversation takes place between everybody and everybody. Ideas can come from anywhere and the wealth is more or less distributed. In a group, organization of wealth, organization of knowledge, etc. is based on power laws. 
and Clay Shirky again writes a lot, quite a lot about this, representing this as normal. I don't think it's normal. I, I think it's a property of a specific type of organization. I've talked about that before. But the idea here is that you have a few people who have a lot, either a lot of money or a lot of links to their website or a lot of followers on Twitter or whatever, and then a whole bunch of people, what is commonly called the long tail, I call it the poor, who have only a little money, only a few links, only a few followers on Twitter. And in the environment of the power law, knowledge, like money, flows from authority. It flows from the center. It flows from the stars and the gurus. In a network, by contrast, as a result of the conversation, as a result of the interactions between people with roughly similar power, wealth, ideas, etc., knowledge emerges. It emerges from the interaction between people. It's not a property of one person which is then distributed. It's something new that is created through the interactions of all the people in the network. So that's the basic concept. And this is, you know, the bare bones, vanilla version of the diagram. But I'd like to give some examples of what I mean so I can draw out the concept a bit and make it a bit more animated in your mind. So first of all, let's look at groups. That's what we do today in schools, in classes, isn't it? We put people in a group, everybody follows the same curriculum, there's one teacher in authority, the knowledge flows from the teacher to the individuals in the class. As compared to, well, we don't know what. Could be anything. In the group, if we look to the left there, we see some pretty typical examples of this sense from the center to the individual distribution. TV, radio, books, newspaper, they all flow from the center out to the periphery, from the author to the readers, from the publisher to the consumer. By contrast, think of talking. In talking, having a conversation, you don't have a case where one person is talking to a thousand people at once, typically. You have one person to another, talking to another, maybe three or four people talking in a group, and that's it. The telephone is an even better example. You don't call up, you know, all of Russia. Uh, you call up your friend. You call up maybe if you're going to have a conference call. You might call a couple dozen people, but that's about it. We talk about a television network as opposed to, say, a publishing empire. If we look at unity and diversity, again, the same sort of concepts here. Um, in, the, in the corporate world, the expression of unity is in the all staff email. One message from the president goes to everyone. But network organization in a corporation is based on personal email, personal communications. The single individual doesn't typically send an email to every other person in the corporation. That's known as a fireable offense, unless you're the president, of course. Let's look at coordination and autonomy. Well, uh, the corporate website or the corporate portal is a classic example of coordination. Sure, there's content there, but it's content that was organized, managed, and approved by the president, by public relations, by the VP marketing, whomever, right? Uh, by contrast, think of the personal homepage or the personal blog where there is no central coordination of what gets published in blogs or homepages. Each person decides for him or herself what their own personal website is going to contain. Let's look at closed and openness. There are a bunch of examples here we could look at. The classic example of closed, of course, is a learning management system. You have to belong to the institution or the university. You have to pay tuition. You have to log in. And then everything's locked down once you're in. By contrast, think of a personal learning environment where you control the access to it. Your personal environment is your own. It is whatever you can access on the open internet that works for you. 
You decide whether or not you share with the rest. It's as open or as closed as you want. Coordination. Traditional learning is based on things like learning objectives, learning design, or instructional design, as compared to self-directed learning, perhaps, the creation of a personal portfolio, or even when we're working in networks, things like the community of practice. We're still autonomous, but we're cooperating, we're exchanging, we're finding something of mutual value in that exchange. Closed. IEEE 1484.12.1, which you cannot just get off the internet. That's the standard for learning object metadata. Uh, MS Word, uh, it's more open now than it used to be, but it's still kind of a closed environment as compared to the super open formats of things like RSS or HTML. These are the standards on which the open web was built. The open internet was built on open specifications. I even contrast sometimes between a standard which is based on regulation and authority and a specification which is based on protocol and agreement. You are required to follow a standard. You can follow a specification or a protocol. Closed systems and enterprise environments have passwords. They have authentication. It is often more difficult to get into one of these networks than it is to hack it. At least that's what recent news seems to indicate. As compared to in a distributed system, you manage your own identity, whether it's through OpenID, maybe not the most successful thing in the world, or if you use your Google login or whatever. The idea is that in a network, each person maintains and manages their own identity, which they can share or not share with others as they please. In a distributive system, well, again, it's a broadcast that can also include a podcast. It can also include a video podcast or vodcast. That includes all of these YouTube videos for money things that have been going around and creating fake news, etc., etc. By contrast, we have Skype or other you know, person to person video communications. It's our picture telephones that we were always promised. Maybe the personal podcast, kind of mixed feelings on that, instant messaging and other things. On the distributed side, Twitter, Facebook, and other social media. It's again, it's this whole broadcast model, right? You want lots of followers. You want lots of Facebook likes. As compared to social networks, properly so called, I would use, for example, Mastodon or something like that, where the network is distributed. We don't know and don't care how many followers people have. And you're not talking to the entire world when you post something. You're just talking to your community of friends. Anyhow, that's the groups versus networks diagram. This is a nice cleaned up version of the diagram that I created around 10 years ago, along with an explanation of that diagram. So I'll post a link in the description where you can download this just as a graphic. Uh, in the meantime, if you have questions, comments, do let me know. I'm Stephen Downs. My website is www.downs.ca. Come to it or not, whatever. Happy to uh, have a conversation with you. Bye for now.